Good evening. Let me see. How many people do we have here? Seven. Oh, Clarence is here. Lisa's. Hi, here. Clarence. Hi, everybody. So I would like to call the select board meeting of May 27th, 2021 to order at 6.30 p.m. So welcome, everybody. Um, first order of agenda, there's a statement that I just wanted to make. Um, and basically, as everyone probably knows, we had a serious um, fire at Camp Mackinac. So on behalf of the town of Stockbridge, the Stockbridge Select Board would like to thank Camp, Camp Mackinac staff and the Good Samaritans who reported the fire and all our neighbors who responded with mutual aid to the May 21st fire call at Camp Mackinac, namely the Stockbridge Fire, Police and Highway Departments, Lennox Fire and Police Departments, Lee and Richmond Fire Departments. In addition, we thank fire departments from Great Barrington, West Stockbridge, Egremont, Hinsdale, Otis, Beckett, Blandford, Canaan, New York, East Chatham, New York, and New Lebanon, New York. Thanks also to Richmond Ambulance, Southern Berkshire Ambulance, and County Ambulance Service for their response, and Tanglewood for their staff assistance and the use of their private hydrant at the Lindy Center. A special thank you to the Berkshire County Sheriff's Control Center for effectively dispatching and um, providing emergency response coordination. And just so everyone knows, Camp Mackinac will open for its season as scheduled, and we are most thankful that no one was seriously injured. We only had one firefighter with um, minor uh, dehydration who was treated and released immediately. So we were very, very fortunate. That being said, we also have this evening a late arriving letter, but it is informational in nature from the Stockbridge Muncie Tribal Historic Preservation Group. And it is about upcoming archeological fieldwork plans. And I just like to read their statement. So dear town of Stockbridge Select Board, I'm reaching out on behalf of the Stockbridge Muncie Community Tribal Historic Preservation Office to provide an update on the upcoming 1739 Stockbridge Meeting House and 1783 Ox Roast slash King Solomon home site excavations. As you are likely aware, the 1739 Meeting House excavation was approved by the Stockbridge Board of Selectmen in December 2019 with the approval for the 1783 Ox Roast site excavation following shortly after in January 2020. Recently, the SMC THPO has received the final approved archeological permits from the Massachusetts Historic Commission and is now ready to start work. Background, the SMC received an underrepresented community grant from the National Park Services, MPS, to conduct the Meeting House project and work on national register updates to include Mohican history. The excavation of the 1739 Meeting House is of great importance as it has not been previously excavated and is at risk of disturbance from any future construction activities. In addition, we hope to better locate and document the site of the 1783 Ox Roast King Solomon home site so that we can work to better preserve and understand it in the future. This is the second phase of testing on the site. We appreciate the Community Preservation Commission's support provided for the Ox Roast King Solomon project. The locations, the 1739 Meeting House site location is in front of the Chime Tower. The 1783 Ox Roast King Solomon home site is in between the Mary Flynn Trail and the river. Fieldwork information, as the town is the landowner as well as out of a spirit of goodwill and community partnership regarding our shared history, I want to share some updates and plans for the field work with the select board. Tuesday, June 2nd through Saturday, June 5th, our subcontractor, Morton Archaeological, will be conducting a combined non-invasive geophysical survey consisting of ground penetrating radar and magnetometer with no ground disturbance, as well as brush clearing in order to begin preliminary field work. A representative from our THPO office will be on site as project manager each day and to field any questions. During this phase of the work next week, the THPO and archeology span firm 
aim to clear brush from the Ox Rose site in order to maximize the radar's effectiveness. We have reached out to the Conservation Commission and Laurel Hill Association for any specific direction they have for the brush removing crew. The week of July 5th, based on the results of the above non-invasive geophysical survey, we will conduct limited shovel test pit surveys starting July 5th for up to 10 days. We wanted to note, we expect to have a few roughly five to six shallow excavation holes near the chime tower as part of the 1739 meeting house archeological testing. They will be covered in boards at the end of each day. Additionally, we are willing to tape up the area if you would like to minimize the risk of people falling. If there is any comment input on this, please reach out. In between the phases of testing, i.e. the end of June through July 5th, we would like to leave some small wooden stakes by the chime tower as part of our testing grid. If this is an issue for mowing, please let us know and we can find an alternative. Media public involvement. Throughout the project, there is likely to be media interest. If there are any specific inquiries for the town, we will plan to direct queries to the select board chair as the primary contact unless otherwise requested. We would be proud and excited to engage the Stockbridge community in this project, which seeks to preserve and protect our mutual history. As a result, we look forward to planning a community presentation in the fall. During the testing, we will have an SMC staff member on site as the contact for any community questions that come up, and we'll have an official information sheet available. We welcome community members to stop by and be interested and proud of this work we are mutually embarking upon. We just ask that people give space to the archeologists to do their work and that we practice social distancing. Should you have any questions and our requests for specific documents, maps, or permits, do not hesitate to reach out. She gets her cell phone number if needed on site. We look forward to any future collaboration on this project and others. Thank you very much for your support and interest. Sincerely, Bonnie Hartley, Tribal Historic Preservation Manager. So we're all looking forward to this. And I would say um, yeah. for us, in terms of safety, yeah, it sounds like. They're taking um, care of it. Yeah. In Lenny Town is all good. Yeah, highway so department. Hugh, we'll be checking on them. We'll make check. sure that it's OK and there isn't any problem with them staking an area mm -hmm. out. So That's but great. we needed to make that announcement because it did come in late. We couldn't get it on the agenda. So but it's informational only. So uh, moving on. Next on the agenda, we need to act on the meeting minutes for April 8th, April 15th, and April 22nd. Do I hear a motion? I'll to make a motion to accept the minutes of the April 8th, 15th, and 22nd. I'll second it. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Pat, you're up. Laurel Hill Association, proposed trail signs, Mary Flynn Trail, Laura's Tower, and Ice Glen. So we all have a copy of what you share? Can yep, if you can share screen. Uh, you all have a copy? Let's see. She wants to do the share screen. Okay. I oh, want yeah. to be able to share my... Okay. Um, Steve, is screen sharing on? Made her co-host. So uh, yeah, I, I made Pat uh, co-host, so she should be able to share her screen. Okay, didn't notice. Thank you. I don't see being able to share screen. Well, kind of the bottom, there's a icon. Yeah, but I don't see the being able to share my screen. Well, you click uh, on the green and then yeah, you go. Yeah, no, but I, I see the, I see a different, um, oh, maybe it's, well, I'll start up. I'll okay. start with this one. Okay. Um, there are three trails that Laurel Hill maintains and they all start at the end of the, the south end of the, um, Goodrich Memorial Footbridge, which you'll see with my cursor is right there. And the Mary Flynn Trail, as you can see in yellow, and then the Lars Tower and Ice Glen Trails, which are combined up until the split. And then the white Ice Glen Trail goes through Ice Glen and the orange goes up to Lars Lookout Tower. And also, um, 
I will. And here's a map, a satellite map of that same area. And you'll see that the Ice Glen property goes all the way down to the river. So that on the south end of the footbridge is, is all Ice Glen property here. And here's the actual Glen itself. And this is the adjoining Rab property. The Rabs own the driveway that goes all the way down to Ice Glen Road. And so that the southern entrance to the Glen goes up their driveway and then into the Glen here. Laurel Hill has uh, maintained the Ice Glen property trails for Jeepers. I have no idea when they first started doing that. Um, I know that in the 70s, when I was working on the trails committee, before I went on the board, um, Ice Glen was doing the trails. But at any rate, those, those trails um, all start on town property and go through town property um, over to um, Laura's Tower or the Cedric Reservation property that Laurel Hill owns. So that, uh, and we would like to put some trail rule signs on the trails that would look like this. This is a copy of the trail sign that- We don't see are, that. Yeah, that we're gonna be putting on Laurel Hill properties. It's a different wording than the proposed sign for um, the trail. Okay, yeah, I think you have to unshare and then if it's a different program, we're not seeing it. Oh, okay. You have to like then basically choose that screen. I'm gonna choose your file. Okay, I'm used to being able to see my whole desktop and select, so that's uh, different. Okay. You might have to unshare and reshare the okay. via Zoom. Stop share. Yep, and then go back. Yep, you yep. got it. Do you see that now, the green yes. sign? This is the sign with the wording that we're putting on our properties. The ones that, you know, things like uh, Lower Bowker's Woods, Laurel Hill Park, whatever. And these are two square foot signs. Um, Can you zoom I, in just a little? Yeah, I'll get this bigger. Whoops, it's too big. Is that better? Yeah, sure. Okay, that's a sample of the signs that are gonna go on our properties, but not for these trails. So now I'll show you, uh, I might have to stop sharing again. Um, let's see. I think you can just close it. No, I think you can switch you out of this one. File and open a different file. Well, it's a different, I'll try. Okay. Can you see that? So that's like sort of a, in, uh, like one of these interpretive signs or whatever they call it. Yeah, um, do you see the white sign now? No. Or not? no. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll I'll stop sharing and 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 do it again. So this is the wording that we're proposing for the signs that will go on the Laurel Hill, the trails, the three trails that Laurel Hill manages, and we would we would love to be able to use the town logo if possible so that people will know that it's both town and Laurel Hill that are involved. And this is the wording that would go on that particular sign. Right. With, with um, do's and don'ts. I can make this a little bigger. So it's easier to see. What is the graphic at the bottom? Pardon? What is the graphic at the bottom? That's the, the QR code. Oh, I see, okay. To scan. That's yeah, so people can scan it with their phones. Okay, got it. Yeah, and it actually has the, you'll like this, Patrick, it's actually got the logo inside. Yeah. The, the, the flower. <laughs> <laughs> it's my, my Waldo. I did that logo just so you know. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. And so this is, this is what we would love to be able to do and be able to sh show people that, you know, it's not just Laurel Hill. It's these are town properties that we're going across. So that these three trails all start out on Laurel Hill property 
-hmm. and go into and come back from Laurel Hill, La excuse me, they start on town property and go into and come back onto Laurel, uh, town property. Mm -hmm. We would like to be able to place one sign at the beginning of the Mary Flynn Trail, which would, I think I have to stop sharing and share again. Pat, I got one question for you while you're, while you're um, and this is more from Michael too. Um, uh, I believe on town property, we need to allow hunting. Isn't that true guys? I think that's the policy of the town, at least as I understand it. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think on the private property, you can ban hunting, but I'm not sure we, we do that on public property. I'd have to check that. Don't know offhand, and depending on the location of these trails, uh, some of them are obviously some of these are right against the river and prop they're within the distance. The 500 feet rule. Yeah, yeah right. cause the, the noble, the nobles property is right here. Can you all see? Yeah, I think yeah. you're yeah, seeing. No, I, yeah. I get it. It's just that the property goes pretty far, you know, up the ridge. And if it's more than 500 yeah. feet away from a domicile, then technically at least on, you know, state and town property. Yeah. That, 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 that we are, we are, we need to be a little careful saying no hunting. I just don't want to, you know, annoy anybody who supports those activities. Since the trail goes into Laurel Hill property, I would think that that would qualify maybe. And how about we just have you, Pat, and Michael work it out? I'm totally fine yeah. with whatever you want. Okay, I'll just check with yeah. Michael on that. Okay. Right. But we'd like to put a, tra a, a sign, this sign at the beginning of the Mary Flynn Trail. Whoops, I shouldn't have done that. Um, and also, um, right across the railroad tracks as you go up the start of the joint trail and then one at the southern entrance near the Rabs property line, just inside the Rabs property line. So that's that's what we were proposing and we would we would dearly love it if you would let us use the logo, but I can understand if there's any kind of legal ramifications, but I think it would be nice for the people that are using the trails to know that the, that the town is involved in this. Well, just so you know, the town clerk actually has the authority over the use of the town seal. And um, so she approves of the use of the town seal in this case. So I think if we vet with legal, the verbiage, yeah. deal with the hunting, um, I don't think there's any problem. Do you have any I have no comments? issues whatsoever. No, I'm I good with it. Okay. I will, I will check Tuesday, Pat, with uh, legal and get back to you on Tuesday. It turns out the town seal is kind of a sticking point. I've got about 200 magnets in my house that, uh, uh, that it was a hard lesson learned. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. And do we want to- Thank you, Pat. Do we want to vote on the, the designs otherwise or no? Oh, don't we have to nice. approve the designs? Isn't that why we're? I think you would. We we would want you to at least yeah. approve the 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 do's and don'ts. In other words, and that's what yeah. Mike is going to with contingent on with. Yeah, with the contingent yeah. that you'll figure out the logo. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I move that we approve the design and the verbiage, with the contingency that we have to check with council. Um, there might be a minor change. Um, and, the, and could and check with Terry on the logo usage if that one. Includes. So that's already done. Oh, that is. That's already done. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Great. So did she approve it or no? Yes. Oh, so, oh, so yes. your logo is approved. Yes. No, I didn't yes. understand that part. Yeah. Okay. You're at this meeting, right? <laughs> yeah. I <get> it. <laughs> and anyway, my ears are different than second? your ears. We've learned that the best year. Do I have a second that we approve of I, the verbiage with the exception of vetting the hunting? Oh, second. All right. All those in favor. This is one we vote. Yes. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank All right. You. Thank you. Nice and it's Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Come back soon. <laughs> I'll stay on. <laughs> All right. So next on the agenda, we have to take action on a one day all alcohol license for Norman Rockwell Museum for June 12th, 2021 from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, for a fundraiser on museum grounds. Mm -hmm. And this is just a one day um, permit um, that is not covered under their alcohol license. This is the wizard ball. So get your costumes ready. 
So I make a motion we approve it. Is there any discussion or questions nope. about this? All right, I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Yes, Next on the agenda, we have the annual entertainment license application of handcrafted catering for events located at 2 Depot Street owned by the Berkshire Scenic Railway Museum, Inc. Um, we are scheduling, Justin. Um, we're giving you notice that we are going to be scheduling a hearing for to take place on June 10th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m to um, address your application. And this gives you a little additional time in terms of gathering more information and specifics about your parking plans. Um, you will be receiving both an email and notification via um, postal service as well. But we're giving you notice tonight that we are scheduling that meeting and it will be June 10th at 6.30 p.m. You wanna, Justin, you, you wanna- Okay, thank you. You want to maintain the entertainment license application or switch over to sort of just doing the first ones as special permits? So at the end of the day, um, is that Patrick? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Um, so at the end of the day, the, the goal here is to, um, you know, just get this going. And, and um, uh, I was I was actually guided um, by Teresa Zanetti. Um, when I just said what we were gonna do when I was calling the town and the fire and the police and everything. And I was guided to fill out for this form, whatever's the, the whatever the town really prefers or the, the least path of, of resistance. Um, I think the idea behind the annual is why she had me do that is twofold. Uh, one was expenses, but also we were really just concerned. We, we deal with some, substantial sums of money and perishable dates in our business. So for example, if I'm selling you a wedding for next June, 2022, we just wanted to be insured that we could in fact do it rather than waiting and filing right. for just a my concern at that for time. You, you're, you, should, you should check with your council, but my concern for you is you have an offsite liquor license. And if you are the applicant for this property, I don't know that that offsite liquor license as a caterer is going to be able to be used on this property. So before you will go through with this, I would suggest you check with your council and make sure that. Excuse me, Patrick. Yeah. We're here. We have set a hearing date. This is all to be discussed at a hearing on. I was hoping you would withdraw it. Well, he has the option. That's what I'm asking him if he wants to do. Right. So just so Teresa would have advised you just on what the different ones are, but ultimately decisions are of the individual. We don't recommend a course of we action. Don't tell people how hard. to apply. So Justin, how would you like to proceed with this? I, I guess we'll, we'll, since we're down this road, we'll keep the permit. And then I always, uh, it sounds like I always have the right to apply for a one day event permit as it is anyway. So I'd like to try to establish this so that we, it's just smoother operating procedure. Right, and the bottom line, Justin, regardless of which type of permit or license you're applying for, um, there's still unanswered questions. Um, and we have heard from Laurel Hill and they'd like to follow up with you. Um, and you re we really need a little more detailed information. And this gives you a little bit of time um, to pull together that kind of information, the specifics, particularly about the parking. And, and to address. And to address. You should be prepared to address concerns about. Concerns about alcohol, Patrick, service, address. et cetera. Yeah, well, uh, that, that sounds great. We'll be happy to address that. We would, of course, be pulling the permits day of. And ultimately, um, I've heard from Laurel Hill, too, and we very much hope to work with them for sure, because that'll make the space yeah. much nicer. But ultimately, even if we were doing an event in the train station, we would be operating with a shuttle service if we weren't allowed parking. So, um, yeah, but, but we'd to love to work with Laurel us. Hill. Yeah, but you you'd shuttle service. Identify for us where you would have 50 parking spaces available. Because based on your application, our permit requires 2.5 spots per, um, for one, one spot space per, per 2.5 patrons. patrons. 
In other words, you have to have parking with this particular application. Yes. Off street, it's an off street parking requirement in our bylaws. Got it. Okay. So, I mean, maybe it, it just, it, it, it's uh, ultimately, I was, I know you said you don't give guidance. I was just kind of waving, raising my hand and coming to the town to see how best to proceed. Maybe I should just withdraw this and then, you know, file for a permits when there's a, a given event and talk to Laurel Hill and hope to work with them. Well, still, when you file that permit, the same kinds of information, the same questions yeah. are going to be asked. So we still need that kind of specific information in terms of where are people going to park? Well, what I'm, what I'm trying to ask there is when we, Pardon me? When, there might when be we have to for guests on a special permit. Well, yeah. it depends what, what on how question, you. What my question is, is when we do a wedding, we arrange for shuttle services. Typically shuttles are circulating and picking people up at different Airbnbs and hotels and, and the like. Are, are you saying that that's we still have to provide for parking even if no one's parking? We could address those each on an individual case basis if he's coming in one at a time. If right. he's saying that he's gonna operate without, and then we'd have to identify where. Right. Um, we still have, would have to have some general um, idea, of, idea of how that's handled. And if you're going for individual permits, then for each individual instance, you'll have a better idea of exactly how many guests are, are expected, for instance, as opposed to with an annual license, you have a range here. And based on the maximum of the range that you put on your application, it would require parking for 50 cars. But this is the first that you've mentioned that you're going to run a shuttle from, you know, one now we mentioned that in the first meeting that's that's you talked about a operating. shuttle but you also talked about talking with laurel hill about parking so it's a little confusing we don't have the details right now well yes we hope to work with laurel hill with that being said if laurel hill said for instance hey we're not interested we would still be hosting events and you know trying to uh, and then we just wouldn't have parking so Right now, we'll set the hearing for the 10th. You right. can decide right up till the night of the 10th if you wish to continue this, the application. You have the full the full application and the policy is online. So uh, okay. the full policy online and, and just be prepared to come on the 10th to address those. Or at that time, if you wish to move to one day license, you can simply notify the town in writing that you're withdrawing and would like to just move to one day licenses. Very well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. All right. Next on the agenda, um, Stockbridge Bowl recommendations from the Berkshire County League of Sportsmen. We have Dan Maraglia with us tonight. He's here with us in town hall. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Dan Hi, Dan. Daniel Morelia. Um, I sit on a board and a representative to the Berkshire County League of Sportsmen. Uh, it's an umbrella group. We represent over 4,000 sportsmen in Berkshire County. So we listen to a lot of, uh, you know, I'm here with my friend tonight who runs a fishing organization, um, Bill Gates, um, who's quite familiar with our lakes and ponds and over the years, we tried to look at um, addressing, making our lakes more user-friendly for the public. And one of the current situations we have here, we have a beautiful boat ramp at Stockbridge Bowl, but it's not easily accessible for um, whether you're a boater or a fisherman or a kayaker or a canoeer, as far as there is no boat ramp. So when you're backing down a concrete structure, and especially a concrete structure that has to be maintained, and this is a public access ramp, but it's maintained by the town, you have issues with like silting and gravel that's coming off of the parking lot. Um, so if you have a sign that says boat ramp slippery, well, it's slippery because of conditions and those conditions require maintenance. You have a uh, department which is public access um which is run by david cameron public access fisheries and wildlife 
and they have the means to even work with the town if there was a complaint uh, to be asked to come in with such equipment to help clean out uh, what's called, you know, the silting and the piled up areas to make the ramp more user friendly. Um, what we're looking at is what we're asking for because we've had a lot of complaints and it's just not Stockbridge Bowl. It, it happens with other lakes and ponds in the communities. They don't have easy access in and out of the water for our lake users. Um, but lake Buell is another example. Goose Pond is another example where we don't, we've got, you know, money being put in for your boat ramps, but you're, there is no boat ramps. No docks. Boat, 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 boat docks. So the public access will help as long as you go through the process of uh, trying to make your ramps more user friendly. Um, it starts again with uh, the permitting process, you know, through the town, um, signing on that, uh, you know, would be a good idea to look at uh, not only looking at, you know, for, for boaters, but also kayakers, they have these ramps now they're called kayak uh assist ramps so if you have you know a large party of kayaks that are going down to the lake instead of um having your ramp overcrowded with two user groups one drug backing down trailers the other one's trying to drag kayaks you've got an area designated for your kayakers where you can actually put your kayaks in these straddles where you can actually walk out and sit down in them and just paddle right off with which really uncongests your uh, usage of that facility. Um, so we're asking for you know, the consideration of the town to support uh, going through the permitting process with the state. The state will work with your local harbor master in the town right there. to design an engineering plan which is the, which suit the best areas for the construction and whether the town works out with the public access board, um, a memorandum of understanding as far as the maintenance where, you know, what the timing you were going to put the, the boat ramp in and when it would come out and where it's going to be stored. Or at the dock, when you say the Right, right. the dock, right. the dock. Um, then that would be worked out with the management of the town. As far as fees go, yes, there would be a fee um, and usually public access, you know, would always like to see if, if the town could chip in, you know, maybe 50%. I'm just throwing a number out. If you got X amount of money um, and the town chips in half and the public access chips in half. And just um, to clarify, the public access is the state public it's access board. the state board. public access board. So it's like the chapter 91 people. Well, exactly. Right. Well, okay. Or so similar. We are already <laughs> contracted with that. Yeah, yeah. Similar. You know, the chapter nine and chapter 91 is the DEP, which is a separate division, but the two closely work together because your town also would need to go through, you know, probably a simple, you know, an RDA. Yeah, sure, of course. And, you know, a simplified license for, for a doc. Um, so what comes with that is, you know, your engineering and your design plan, um, which would be assisted by public access with you know, the Conservation Commission, and you would basically say, you know, here's your layout. This is where we think the best spot is. Um, one problem that I foresee that you have there uh, already at the ramp is you have a fence that's overhanging land underwater, which is one of the abutters has put a fence. So the fence is overhanging the water, yeah. which is not legal. So you, you have an obstruction, um, that is not permitted on a Great Lake, um, and it would also interfere with the process of boaters coming in, and that is what's kind of missing right now with Stockbridge Bowl. Is if you're coming up with your boat, you basically got to take a rope and have to, trying to drag it up the concrete and secure, it, and then try to have somebody walk down, you know, with somebody to try to get in. I watched just multiple people struggle to try to get in and out of their boats there. So that's kind of the 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 goal of this is to try to make it a user friendly uh, place for recreational, uh, mm -hmm. you know, fishermen and uh, lake users, kayakers, et cetera. And um, so that's kind of the main topic. But, you know, when you look at what's going on with the whole area in general. Before we move on, though, right. so the first idea is 
uh, a dock, you know, some kind of a dock structure. So there's people back their boats in, they can just walk onto the dock, get on the boat, and same thing as they're getting out. And that puts the, that allows them to back the boat further into the water uh, so that they don't have to deal with all the silt and the rocks that naturally come off the, the parking lot and go into there. And the other thing is these two kayak or three kayak stations where people can get in the water in the kayak and push out, which I love that idea. So, you know, before we move on though, I think that it might be nice if the SBSC just evaluated these two ideas over as, as one of our priorities for the year, you know, and, uh, and, and took a look at whether that works for us, you know? Well, I don't see why it wouldn't. I think, I think it's definitely a look into it. Right. I mean, we got to do something with that. I mean, we've already signed the agreement, um, but I think the bottom line is, do you have a couple of good examples of where you think it's done well? Do we have any place in Berkshire County where it's done well? Um, we, have, we have towns that are designers. We have towns that are implementing um, uh, Nota Lake as a, a boat ramp, uh, a, boat, a boat dock. Pontusic Lake has a boat dock. Yeah. Um, you got out of the area. Every everybody. Uh, goes to you know proper management is looking at again user-friendly uh ramps so you know latona southwick has a great program mm -hmm. um we're also looking at not stopping here at Stockbridge bowl but moving this venue towards other towns like you know monterey and yeah. uh, tierringham and um working with public access and it has to start the process has to start somewhere first it starts with the public access board the public access board has been contacted um Doug Cameron said he was going to send a letter to your harbor master. It's right here. Doug. That's Gary. Gary. Hey, Gary. You know Gary Kleinerman? Yes, Dan? right here. Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. Yeah, hi. I, I've already talked to Doug Cameron about this. He did suggest we put in boarding docks, and I said, we'd love to have that in. I'll run it by the town. And he also asked for some other ideas that we would like to have done down there. And one of them is to put some asphalt in from the ramp back maybe 100 feet, you know, as much as we can afford. But there are a few other things too. But I think this idea of a boarding ramp is a wonderful idea, and I support it 100%. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you have any examples of places where they're using both a boat dock and a kayak assist ramp? Like do they have that? Yeah. yeah. Well, Richmond Pond. Yeah, Richmond, Richmond, Pond. Richmond Pond. Um, The nice thing about the kayak assist, you can do them laterally or horizontally. De depending on you know your substrate and the depth of the water right so there's where the engineering would come in to play you know your, your wind can play a lot you know how your wind blows in from a certain direction right. and that's one of the reasons where stockers bowl on a windy day that particular shoreline really takes a beating so if you're out there trying to put a boat in and you don't have a secure place to tie your boat up your boat gets pushed in it, it becomes dangerous so you know this is a win situation for you know for the public for the town um and uh, I appreciate the Harbor Master, uh, you know, getting on board with this. And, and uh, well, and the Harbor Master, by the way, is member of the Stockbridge Bowl Stewardship Commission, and he has already brought that up okay. in the meeting. So, recently. <laughs> so yeah, I think we're on top of this, and certainly it's going to come up again. And I see no reason. Oh, we should and, definitely move forward. No, get, yeah, we move forward done. with this. And I think the bottom line is, it just has to be well designed for the particular lay of our land, our lake. What yep. were the other? You were, I interrupted you. You said some other conditions. Um, well, just looking at, you know, the overall, what makes a boat ramp user-friendly, you know, that gets into, you know, either, you know, having a, you know, round table construct uh, discussion with, uh, you know, members of the town, uh, you know, a select board member, a conservation commission member, like a user group, like a fisherman group, and you know, discuss what we can do to look at making it more uh, user friendly, accommodable. I mean, there's a, a lot of a, or the first thing that comes to my mind when I look at it is, I mean, it's a gorgeous place. You got these gorgeous oak trees overhanging your leg, but you get all these major erosion issues that are really, looking really at that too. taking a major damage toll to the root systems and the trees. So we want you want to address the erosion problems that you have near. The water make it more user friendly for people to actually walk and use that. that that's on our radar. You know, you have benches where you have the roots that are coming out of the ground very easily. You can trip over, and then you're looking at rocks down below. Um, over the years, you know, you've had erosion, and then what's been in the embankments as far as you know your rock and your boulders. 
you know, have rolled into the water where people, you know, 10 or 15 years ago used to be able to pull a boat up. Now you've got rocks there. So there's where the conservation would right. come in, you know, what possible just a simple RDA asking for, you know, some of those boulders to be brought up to the bank, incorporate that and with the design to correct some of your erosion problems. The uh, asphalt at the ramp is a great idea because that's part of the problem you have right there is the way a parking lots are designed typically is to drain your water. And what's happening right now is the water is draining towards your ramp. So everything your gravel you have in the parking lot is, is coming down and around and you can see the tracking where your water is making trails coming down. So you want to, you know, a, it'd be nice to come up with a grant plan and write a grant to address the whole area to incorporate uh, non-point source pollution yeah. runoff, whether, you know, a storm drain uh, would be adequate for catch basin to catch a lot of that water to divert it away from going into the lake, but into a catch basin. So that's what I'm talking about an overall concept and a plan for your, for your facility. Um, along with that becomes what you had prior is signage. So you do have a lot of signage there. And what you want to draw is when you get, when you get tourism and you got people coming in there to use a body, the, the first thing I don't want them to see is this big huge sign that says, you know, do not eat the fish, murder, you know, right, right on the first tree you come, right? You know, right, the signage is good, but let's take this and put this on a little, a little plaque somewhere, you know, where that's not the first thing you see. You know, hey, honey, should we uh, think about going somewhere else, you know? No, we, we want to bring people here. So, um, you know, little things like that, you know, like, uh, you know, when you incorporate, you know, bylaws and rules to lakes, um, it's all with good intention, but you, you kind of want to go through your, your rules and regulations once in a while and say, um, you know, the town has incorporated a bylaw, 40, 40 mile an hour speed limit on a body of water, where the state environmental police already has a uh, designated speed limit that's enforceable on all your bodies of water that are not posted, which is 45 miles an hour. So, you know, you, so you tweak the rules a little bit to come down five miles an hour rather than, you know, having an EPO that sees something and goes, you know, hey, he's doing 47, we can get him, but he, you know, so little things like that. I mean, you have a, uh, uh, you know, a rule and regulation, which is a, a 300 foot no wake zone around a lake. Um, you know, the state, no wake zones are 150 feet. So you moved it to 300 feet. Um, it, you know, a small lake. It, it's a small lake, but uh, so you just basically go through them and say, you know, hey, you know, this works, you know, this maybe, you know, doesn't work and just, you know, relook at your rules and regulations and your bylaws, make sure that, you know, they're enforceable by, you know, the environmental police. Um, well, also, there's no way that folks are respecting the 300 foot wakes, no wakes. You can't. Right. I mean, right. it's just, we have, it's, it's another example of a bylaw we have in our books that's not either enforceable or even reasonable because i see people way closer to the shore you know water skiing and doing everything so yeah that's another issue to I've, yeah but that's, you know that's a round table else. yeah that's right how do you know these are all topics that can come in front it's, of yeah, it's a round table discussion um, us, because to yeah. me it makes no sense to have bylaws that exceed what the state already has in place. And if you follow what the state has in place, it can be enforced at least. That's right. You have the chance it, of it, it, it can be, but there is bylaws that towns can have that are enforceable by the environmental police as long as you go through the right procedures. But if the environmental police aren't on the water to enforce anything, then it's up to the town right. to have their own enforcement. So that gets right. kind of tricky. Right. Uh, but you know, I see, I see something are, about that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Gary, go ahead. Um, Back in the early 90s, uh, we had a number of meetings, the Stockbridge Bowl Association, the town and the environmental police, and we came up with a bunch of different things that were desired around the lake. Um, so one of which, for instance, is the banning of jet skis and the 300 foot buffer zone. Uh, all these things were take, were, uh, were voted on and we sent them to the uh, state attorney general and they were approved so i as far as we know that they they are the law if they are approved by the attorney general they are the law oh yeah yeah yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah you that's, think that's, they're good laws gary or any of them not working well 
for the most part, they're working. A lot of times people just ignore them, but uh, you know, I used to have to <laughs> talk with them. Well, that's my question. The, the meeting you were just talking about with the environmental police and the SBA, when was that? That was in the early 90s. Okay. That was almost, almost 30 years ago. How old were you, like 10? <laughs> uh, I <Yeah>. wish. <laughs> I can see you leaving the jet skis, but maybe it's yeah, I remember the jet ski issue. Right? Up and things back to the state. Well, we got to be careful with the jet skis. You know, I don't want jet skis in there. Well, I'm just saying, like, yeah, we got to be a little bit cautious because it's uh, there's been some litigation around that by the jet ski companies. Yeah, well, I think that's you know, to me personally, I think that's one of the best ordinances you have on uh, Stockbridge Bowl. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just I can see dumping back. Yeah, I'd, I'd love love to see it happening with more bodies of water. Um, you know, the, that's probably the number one nuisance call for environmental police to report to is jet skis because they just have a, a tendency. They want to have fun, and I think fun is following boats and jumping wakes and driving too close to each other. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I applaud Stockers Bowl actually for going and banning jet skis on a body of water. We have a lot of kayaks, a lot of canoes, a lot of yep. paddle boarders. So then you're talking this more on a fairly small lake. It's it's more of a safety issue mm -hmm. than anything else. But, um, thank you. Yeah, but anyways, thanks for, thanks for your time, guys. And uh, well, thank you, you got very it. much for your information. You're welcome. And I'll get you Dan's contact info, you know, if you ever want to follow oh, yeah, up with absolutely. any of the, I've got it all. Yeah, so I'm glad to help, you know, through the process. And, um, <laughs> you know, if uh, you have any questions or, you know, working with, uh, you know, Harbor Master and Doug Cameron, um, you know, and uh, a great topic for your committee. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we've already touched on it. Yep. Very nice. We've already, he's already brought it up and we've discussed it some. So. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. All right, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Yeah, Gary, thank you. For thank being you. Here. Great. All right. Next on the agenda is streetlight consultant approval. And basically, the committee has recommended that um, we utilize as the lighting consultant, LightSmart Energy Consulting, LLC. And um, we each have this packet. And I'm just wondering if there's any questions about this. Can we just maybe, can, would, would you mind? Just doing a couple sentences on what this project is. Sometimes people watch these tapes and they don't know what we're working on. Well, I'll let Michael do that because he's the one who's sure. been the most involved. Um, so the Streetlight Committee has been meeting for months, uh, looking at uh, the different options to bring LED lighting to the town and possible having the town take over maintenance of our own lights. Right. And LED um, lights reduce energy use. It'll reduce energy and uh, and use by seventy per, at least seventy percent, and it would in turn save the town substantial amounts of money uh, very quickly on street lights. So right now we spend over forty thousand dollars, and we're talking seventy plus percent savings if we take over um, just switching LEDs. If we take over the maintenance, it's actually greater the savings that we can incur. So. We could be looking at you know cutting our thirty thousand dollars annually, mm -hmm. which is um, the cost in the end. We have a warrant article for fifteen thousand to begin our consultant work, and then we're going to go after installation through a DOER grant. Um, but even if we didn't get the grant, we pursued this on our own. The payback is two point six years. Yeah, which it would pay back Very itself cool. and then save going forward. So reduce. It's good for energy consumption and it's good for reducing the town budget. Yep. It's a big win and another big win. Across the board All right, to do this project. A lot of effort was done. The committee was awesome to work with. Um, and Laura Tabesker was uh, the chair of it and did quite a bit of work uh, around this and has been great to work with. I mean, she really does a lot of work as far as the environment and green communities. So we'll get this done, they'll come up with something new that would put these into like computers yeah. will be. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, this particular company, um, they were all pretty much blown away by, and uh, you know some of the yeah. stories that I know in attending one of the meetings, they, everyone that they had talked to initially, 
um, prior to the final <laughs> interviews, um, was very impressed. Um, it's George and Brian Woodbury, so father and son. And everyone was already very impressed. But then Michael shared with me that they apparently also did the island of Jamaica. <laughs> and they had how many hundreds of thousands of lights? A hundred thousand lights. Yeah. So, so it seemed as And the Rhode Island nonprofit, they did the entire state. Right. Yeah. Uh, these guys are 120 towns in Massachusetts. 170. Yeah, something like that. So very impressive group. So yeah. the bottom line is, is um, we just need to approve. Um, Contract. I'll make It'll it be a, co a contingent on funding. Right. That's all approved at the town meeting. I'll make a motion that we go with a recommendation. Contingent upon it being approved at town meeting. And I second yes. the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Laura. Is Laura here? No, she's yeah. not here. Well, thank you. She was, sure she was going to be able to be on. <laughs> I think she's playing bridge or something. <laughs> All righty. Um. <laughs> okay. At the end of these type of meetings. Next on the agenda, we received a, um, a letter from, or actually an email from Richard Seltzer. Um, and I will read it to the Honorable Select Board. I'm writing to confirm the <coughs> offer previously made to Mike Canales. The Stockbridge Bull Association offers to contribute up to $18,500 toward expenses as they are incurred for improvements of the town beach. With the approval of our full board, the SBA feels strongly that the beach is an important amenity for the entire town and town guests. It is also a magnet for attracting younger families to our aging community. Our proposed gift will be delivered as and when the town incurs expenses for the upgrade of the town beach. Please look forward to your acceptance. We look forward to your acceptance of this offer. Richard Seltzer, President, Stockbridge Bowl Association. Mm -hmm. So I move that we approve um, accepting this property. How does work? They, so the money go into an account? Or do we send no, they want us to send them bills and they'll pay them as we get them. And you, which is fine. It, it's a, it's an offer and it's based on us starting the project and incurring expenses. What project is this? Is it tied to a specific project? We already have the beach project ready. It'll be going this fall. Well, it'll this be closed down. Specifically the beach parking lot. Yep. So beach it's it's been lot. designed. Yeah. Yep. Highway and department will be working on it. Some initial work has already been done, I think, in terms of culverts. Um, and then it'll be commencing in the fall. Right. So after the summer season. season is done. Right. right. After the summer season. Right. So, and what's the amount of the gift? 18500 He says up to 18500 toward expenses as they are incurred for and, improvements of the town beach. And that number is significant. Why? That number is significant because <laughs> that is the number which we were ordered to pay the SBA. Right. So it's tax dollars money. I understand. You paid them and they're now putting it toward the beach. Okay. Yeah. Uh, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So if you want to make that motion, I will uh, second it. Accept it. And I'm loath to um, <laughs> deny this and obviously would want to accept it um, for the benefit of the taxpayers. Yes. That's for the taxpayers only. So I second the motion. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, SBA board. Thank you. I believe we have that. Water under the bridge. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Next on the agenda, COVID-19 regulation updates. Um, Michael. We're going to keep this on because there's a whole bunch of things happening at the state level. And um, sorry. What's that called? So Governor Baker has filed uh, legislation to extend certain COVID emergency measures. So in order for him to extend certain measures beyond the expiration of the state of emergency, he needs legislative approval, which is different. During a state of emergency, the governor can issue executive orders and those orders become law for us only during the actual state of emergency. 
So once the state of emergency is lifted on June 15th, technically all changes, all rules that we've been operating under for the last year are gone. This includes things such as, you know, outdoor dining, extension of allowing consumption of alcohol on public property on, for, for outdoor dining, <laughs> um, open meeting law, Zoom use, everything else. Um, so what there, what the he's put forward is a bunch of items. Uh, one is to carry through outdoor dining and alcohol use on public property through the summer into, I believe it's November 29th. So we just basically take it through. People can drink on public property right now? Using sidewalks and oh. restaurants can. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, and then you could use, even if you didn't have a lot board of meeting. allowing for outdoor, as long as you did it, you could Zoom so that we, like right now we have to figure out how we're transitioning away from Zoom to just open public meetings, back to television combination. How are you gonna do this? They're talking about extending that for you know a period of time. So, but because these have to go, they're not as quickly coming through as you saw earlier because, well, he can propose them, they have to go to the legislature for approval. So now it needs the additional step to be taken. So as we get confirmation of items that pass, we'll use this point during our meetings to update what has changed, when new dates have been set for expiration and so forth. Now, uh, there's a difference though between Zoom use and Zoom participation. Right. So we could, as a town, still embrace the ability for our, our uh, townspeople and interested parties to observe our procedures. I know Steve has said that if we have video, uh, you know, that's, that is, even if we don't have our own setup for Zoom, we could take video and they would also post it for us. So I do think one of the questions that we're gonna to wanna to deal with is regardless of what, whether or not the Zoom participation is allowed at the, by the state, you know, I think that we've really benefited from the transparency that we've had because of all of our committee members, the meetings rather have been on Zoom. And I don't know what your thoughts are, but I would like to continue to have the video available, you know, uh, both for people to log in. I think it's good because- Yeah, the town does have its own Zoom account and Mike and I have talked about this. So um, certainly there's a benefit in terms of the increased accessibility for people. That's right. Um, and particularly in, for the select board, we're always videotaped. So, and we're live on TV and then, you know, you can go back and see us anytime online and it's, it's shown on TV. Uh, but we do have committees that aren't necessarily as accessible to everyone and they've benefited greatly from Zoom. Right, most of the other committees in fact. Exactly. So, you know, the, the big question is we have to set up basically um, the procedures for, and you know, so the getting biggest the information out as to how everyone is going to utilize this. So the biggest probably handicap for other committees is that remote participation, boards have to adapt procedures for remote participation. So say like I was just on Park and Rec and everybody was on Zoom. Once the emergency order is lifted, if we haven't adopted a policies and procedures for remote participation for our meetings by each board, you can't have the members of the board on computers. So they can't be at home doing it. No, but they could be in this room. They could be in this room, but depending on how we wanna set up, like some of those committees, like the Park and Rec one, Maybe, it, maybe it's better to just be on Zoom. Are we gonna allow remote participation? Are we not? There's just a bunch of questions that need to get answered. And over the next month of June, we need to figure it out. So I know they're talking about extending that for like through the month of July so that people can figure out the transition. If they wanna have remote participation where you could log in from home and still run meetings remotely, are they gonna allow those? What are they going to allow? Are they going to make some changes? How do you set it up? How do we have to mount it in the other room? Because now you're going to need the camera, an audience, the select board, 
how are you going to make sure everything runs? So right now we just have a system because we don't have to worry about others, but we're going to, I'm going to work with Chris. We're going to look at the other room, setting it up. We had a donation of a large screen TV for that room. So we have a TV for that room. We have the Zoom camera set up. We have the mounting equipment still that's behind me for the Zoom. So those cameras and stuff can get mounted, but we have to figure out how to do it and okay, good. Right. take our time, figure out how to do it. Yeah, the other tricky part of this is if you get, if you're doing both an in-person meeting um, and you have Zoom participation, you need to come up with some kind of procedure, at least maybe a generalized procedure or a recommended procedure for fielding um, the public that's coming in on Zoom. And it's particularly when you get a high participation and a lot of people are out there on Zoom, but you also have people in the room, how are you going to address answering their questions, responding to them? You may have to close mics, for instance, and have everyone come in through chat and every board and committee is gonna have to decide when is it appropriate to respond? You know, how do we appropriately and efficiently respond to everything that's coming in through Zoom when we're also in an in-person meeting? So right. those are the kinds of things we have to look at. Right. And you can consider everywhere from the levels of participation you want, because you could get right down to just putting it out over Zoom, but not allowing people to participate. Right. But I think people are looking for that level of also being able to participate. And the other so. dangerous thing, that the one thing that we see once in a while, um, people will call in on a phone into Zoom and in an open meeting, they need to be identifying who they are. Yeah, that's right. And people are not necessarily doing that now. And they want to speak. And yet to, to speak, you have to be recognized by the chair and you do have to identify yourself. So mm -hmm. we have to deal with those kinds of issues, I think, and straighten them out. Yeah. It can be done. Yeah. yeah. Hey, out, of, out of curiosity, I don't know if we're open meeting for a second. I brought so back uh, open actually, meeting and done talk I was going to ask Clarence what like Lennox and Lee are doing. I don't think we have to necessarily. No, I don't think there's. Clarence, are you with us? Who? Oh. Clarence. I was wondering what Lennox and Lee are doing. He goes to those meetings too, I think. Or Lennox and Richmond, one of them. Well, we can find that out. Yeah, I know. Every Yeah, and I, I, I actually have a manager's meeting next yeah. Tuesday, and I'm going to. It, it, I anticipate we started talking about it the last one about yeah. moving out of things. My, my opinion is the select board go to regular open meetings and that's it. We don't do Zoom, selectmen. Right. All right. Well, we're pretty transparent anyway. Yeah, we want TV over here, and I think we should face right. people face to face so they have something to discuss exactly. and all that stuff. And can we get a gold star for attendance for Anita? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Anita. I didn't know. Hi, Anita. You're hidden. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, we'll just right now not he's filed the legislation. Yeah, we got it. it. Hasn't come through. This will stay on the agenda and we'll just update it yeah. as we go along. Yeah. Wait, can I say something? No. <laughs> <It's Anita. laughs> Who are you? <laughs> it's not talking on Zoom anymore. <laughs> no, that's what. He um there's no way I would make an eight o'clock in the morning meeting. And that's when the Stuckbridge Bowl uh, Stewardship Commission meets. So I can watch it. I get up and I watch it on Zoom and I can participate. But for me to get there at eight o'clock in the morning, I just can't see it happening. So I really appreciate having the Zoom meetings and the option of watching it in real time and being able to participate or just watching later on CTSB. And I think that the whole town really appreciates it. Yes. So thank you. Okay. Was I unmuted? <laughs> oh, you're fine. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Anita. <laughs> Thanks. Anything else? Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, then moving on. Um, I move to enter into executive session for Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body. I declare the board will not return to open meeting session upon completion of the executive sessions. Mm -hmm. Roll call. I'll second the motion. Okay. Patrick White, aye. 
Chuck, I. You can wait until I ask. I'm sorry. <laughs> Chuck, I. Hi, Roxanne. You looked at me. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you.